thing so we are recording now and then share screen mm. Um, this one. Okay, good. Oh. Mm, great. Okay, so let's start the class. Um, good. So, uh, so far we talk about, I mean, some approaches to solve problems. And in particular, one technique that you have seen a lot is this uh, branch and bound algorithms. Uh, oh, yes. Let me just connect this one. Yes, so we have. Uh, Good. Uh, yeah, uh, great. So we have a uh, talk about a uh, divide and conquer techniques. That when you want to solve the problem, you recursively break down a problem into a smaller part, and then you will solve it, and then you will combine it. If we have seen it, for example, for Mary's sword, or for example, for quiz. But there are some, uh, and generally to analyze them, you are doing uh, like via master theorem. Here we want to talk a little bit about the other ways that you can solve the problem. These are the general ways. Uh, and uh, some of them, I mean, you may see more examples in the in 451, but here you should have a very good understanding about this algorithm as well. So the one that is, uh, I mean, used a lot is the backtracking and branch and bound techniques. So what is this one, the backtracking or branch and bound technique? This is an approach to find all solutions to the computational problem. So uh, like uh, you, uh, and we will give the example. So here we try to incrementally essentially uh, build the solution. And as long as some, so we try to, this is the thing that is called branch and bound. So this is some kind of search trees essentially that you try to do that. And as long as you try to incrementally build it. And when you reach to some state that it is just the solution is just, it cannot be the optimum, then you will essentially forget about the rest of this branch. And here, the running time of this algorithm, generally it can be exponential, like two to there. And uh, we will, uh, I mean, see some examples here, but there are some techniques essentially to make them faster. So this kind of backtracking or branch and but essentially try to consider all possibilities. And uh, yeah, you bit by bit, you try to essentially create the solutions and you will try all possibilities. And if you know that with this partial solution that you have built, the rest cannot be a optimum solution, then you will forget about it. Good. The next one uh, that is actually uh, is important are the greedy algorithms. So uh, the greedy algorithms, in that sense, are similar to backtracking algorithms. Here, uh, I mean, in the backtracking algorithm or branch and bond, we consider all possible solutions. This one larger as well. Yes. Uh, good. In the backtracking algorithm, we try actually to, uh, when we try to solve the problem, we consider all uh, possible solutions. Here in the uh, 
a greedy algorithm, we, when you have several options, you say that, okay, one option that I'm taking, I'm taking the best option, and then I will go ahead instead of trying all options. And for some problems, that would be great because you don't need to try all possible options and the running time becomes exponential. The running time can be very good. The, the main issue is that, I mean, generally it is uh, non-trivial to say that among all options, I will take this option and that would be a good solution for me. So it works for some problem, but not for lots of problems. Uh, good. So uh, let's give an example here for this problem. Say you have uh, this, uh, you have 25 cents. These are some of the coins that you have. You have 10 and you have four cents. I mean, these are the coins that you have. And you want to build 41 cents out of it. If you want to do the backtracking algorithms, uh, and you can have, uh, for each of them, you have several of them. You can, uh, so you can use, one coin more than one time. So if you want to do backtracking, then you can try all possibilities. So you may have one. So here you cannot have, this is the thing. So you cannot have 225 cents in the backtracking algorithm because that would be more than that. So you just try one and then you don't try more than one. But then you can try, I mean, the tens, you may have four tens, not five. And then four cents, you can have a lot as well, like 10 of them. So you will consider all possibilities and see whether you can find a solution or not. Can we, the question is that can we create this 41 cents with uh, essentially uh, say minimum number of coins or, uh, or even can we create it with the current coins that I have? Good. So, uh, so there we can actually try uh, this one with a backtracking and try all of possibilities. But as I mentioned, the running time generally would be suffer. However, you can do some uh, back to, like a greedy algorithm. What would be the greedy algorithm? Say always take the largest coin. For example, for 41 cents, then we are taking first 25 cents. Then another 25 cents is not possible. So we will take the next one, the 10 cents. Then we will take it, okay, then we cannot, because it's 35, we cannot, I cannot take another 10 cents, so I will take 4 cents. So it would be 25, 35, 39. Then I cannot take any, anything, and then I don't. So that's a greedy choice that you are. However, uh, actually, you can create this one if you are doing more smartly. So if you are doing 25 cents, and then take 4 cents, 4 cents, and four cents would be uh, how much? Uh, I think that would be 12 and one more four cents. So you can create actually this, this you can, this you cannot do that, but with this one, you can do that. But the greedy choice was not the correct choice. So that's essentially the difference between greedy and backtracking algorithm. Finally, what is the dynamic program? So we will hear this one. And if you go, for example, for Geek for Geeks or I don't know, uh, Hacker Ranks or other websites, these are like you will see lots of this algorithm. And designing a greedy algorithm is very uh, nice things because that you can get very fast things. But generally, it's non-trivial to design, at least for lots of problems. Sometimes you may not get the exact algorithm, but you will get an approximate algorithm. We will mention that as well. Good. But these are the general ways, essentially. You may say divide and conquer. Divide and conquer generally also will be considered part of greedy algorithms. So you have backtracking that you are trying all possibilities. You have greedy algorithm that you are doing some certain choice and you don't change your choice later. That's the main difference. And finally, the backtracking, the dynamic algorithm. And then we are giving some examples of this. So uh, for the dynamic programming, that's the thing that will happen. So it is in some sense is similar to backtracking, in some sense is similar to greedy. So when you try to solve a problem, you may again break it down uh, into a smaller instances. So you may solve this problem and you may solve essentially create some smaller sub problems that you try to solve. It, it might be more than two, it's not just divide and conquer. There might have some intersection. 
The issue is that in the backtracking, you will try all possibilities and then would come exponential. However, it can be the case for some problems. Uh, when you try to create these sub problems, you may try different branches, but at the end you will come with the same uh, with the same sub problem that you need. So in that case, what can we do? The idea is that this sub problem, once you solve it, then save it in an array or I mean any matrix or something like this. And then next time that you will there, so you will compute for this problem. So you will essentially you are just doing some branch and bound. You will come you uh, through this one. So you are doing some branch and bound here. Then uh, then you will do this one. Then you will create this problem. This problem it turns out to be this sub problem that you want to solve. Then you will come here also. Oh, you will see this is another sub problem, but this is exactly the same sub problem. Now, the first time that you will come, first time, uh, store it. Uh, so uh, uh, first time, uh, uh, compute. And uh, store. So first time, what do you do? You compute it and uh, store it. What do you do a second time? Second time, just use it. Or second or third or fourth time. This actually can speed up your algorithm a lot and it can get it from exponential to polynomial time. This is a particular way, I mean, this is a general dynamic programming and the way that it's called, it is called memoized. It's called memoized dynamic programming. But in some sense, we somehow we memorized the solutions that we are computing. Uh, by the way, the people on Zoom, uh, do you see the, my writing and the, share the screen? Yep, we do. And do you hear me well? Yep. Yep. Uh, great. Okay. So that's the one. And generally the proof technique for dynamic programming would be by induction. We are proving the results by induction. Let's see some examples. So these are the three approaches then. Backtracking, greedy algorithms, and then dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is somehow in between uh, that you are doing somehow similar backtracking algorithm, but you are doing it in a smart way that you, when you get the sub problems, this sub problem would be always the same. So if the, in the sub problems are, each of them is different things, then of course saving it would be not that much helpful because you have a still exponential number of sub problems that you want to solve it. However, if you can do it in a way that the sub problem would be the same, one time you will compute it, then you will store it. Next time you don't need to compute it. That actually turned out to be the running time would be much better. And for example, if you have, a, it's like something like N by K matrix, and you will say that all my instances would be one of these instances of this matrix n by k. So the total running time actually would be n times k. Because for each of them, once you compute, you say for each of them, computation takes only order one from the previous things. Then for each of these uh, cells, so that's the thing that I'm saying. Maybe I just draw it here, it would be better. So you have n times k, and then each cell here, say it takes order one to compute it from the other order one. Then the total running time of this algorithm would be order n k because at the end you need to just fill in this matrix. If you fill in this matrix, you have the whole solution, and that would be the dynamic problem. And these are the main general things. Almost any problem that you are considering, it might be in different fields. You may consider some geometric problems or other things. One of these techniques can be used essentially. So that's the general idea of essentially algorithms. <laughs> Uh, good. So uh, let's see. I mean, more examples now, and some of the instances of these problems. Any questions so far? Yeah. So what's the difference between backtracking and what you're using brute force? It's the same thing. I mean, this backtracking brute force or branch and bound are the same. Generally, I mean, when we say about the backtracking, you expect that you are cutting some branches. That's, that's the probably would be the main difference. In the order, it does not change, but it may make for some intermediate range, it might, if you want to do brute force, uh, 
you may essentially take uh, forever, but if you do some uh, branches and cut some of the branches, branch and bound techniques, then you might actually solve the problem. But for large instances, generally none of them work essentially. Good. So yes, yeah, so the question was about the, the difference between brute force and backtracking that I mentioned. Good. So let's see some example. So this is a, a special, uh, this is a problem which is called a subset sum problem, which is a special case of a knapsack problem. So what is the problem? Uh, so this is a very practical uh, problem, essentially. You have a knapsack and you want to essentially pack it fully. And the question that, I mean, how you can do that? You want to get essentially, I mean, this is like the case, this is a, a, a I mean, a person, I think that was an example, is that a person goes to robbery and has some uh, knapsack, you want to make it completely full and go out. How he can do that? Uh, good. And maybe he has an app that you need to write for that. No, this app is for everything. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, now, uh, what is the problem? So let's formalize this. So you are given an integer K and in items of different sizes, such that the item I has size SI. And so this is, let's say it is a linear case. You can consider two-dimensional or three-dimensional case as well. But say that uh, these are the items that you have it. And this is a simplest form that you have N items. And this is the item one has, I mean, size S1, S2 to SK, uh, sorry, SN. These are the items. So these are n items. And then you have a k is also given to you. You want to find select some of these guys, not probably all of them. So select some. Select some. Uh, with size equal to k. Great. Now, uh, is the problem clear? Is a bit better. Mm. Good. So, and let's try different uh, approaches that we discussed. So, let's do first greedy algorithm. So what does greedy is doing that is always using the uh, yes so we always use the first or the largest item that you can pick good so uh, let's see uh, so let's see what are the items that we have so we have k equal to 13 here and n is equal to 4 it means that we have four items the size of them is six, five, four, three. This is very similar to this kind of, uh, essentially have some coins and you want to create a number. But you will see the exact quote here. So greedy is easy. Just, I mean, picks, uh, uh, I mean, the, like the first one. I mean, say if you are sorting them from the biggest to a smallest, largest to a smallest, we will take the first one. As, uh, I mean, here, uh, and say here in this case, the only difference between here and there is that the size of each item, we have only one item of any size. Here we could have many coins of the same type. Here we have only so one item of each size. However, note that, I mean, you may have uh, two items, one is two, the other one is two, that's possible. But all the items that you have, uh, you cannot, there is only one item of that type, that size. Good. So let's, uh, these, I say these are the, all the sizes are different. So what can we do? The greedy is doing, I mean, this is a trivial algorithm to write. First, it's essentially to make 13. First, it selects six. Then it selects five would be 11, and then it fails because there are two remains and there is no two here. And 
Yeah, and uh, I mean, six plus uh, five, and we can take essentially, we can, if we take three, then three would be more than essentially the 13 that we have. Now let's do, what, how can we do this one with back rank? So let me just erase some of this. Mm. So, um, let's see the backtracking. So this is essentially brute force, as you mentioned as well for this one. Uh, this is the typical things that we can do it as a backtrack. So, uh, and this way that we are writing is important, how we can write actually a backtracking. So we have the backtracking or brute force, N, K, and sort. What is n? Is the n is the number that we uh, essentially that we want to uh, uh, let me just make sure that yeah. So n is the remaining number of items remaining uh, number of items. K is the remaining value. So this is N, so this is K. K is the remaining value. And soul is the solution so far. Good. So uh, how can we do that? So we will say essentially, I mean, begin. So we need to do some cases. This is a recursive algorithm. So backtracking, we generally we write them as a recursive algorithm. So we are putting some checks that if these are the things that are some of the things that we reach, then we may not want to continue in the recursive. Otherwise, we do the recursion. So we say that if n equal to zero and k equal to zero, then return true. What's the meaning of that? It means that the value, the number of items that you have is zero. And also the remaining uh, value that you want to do it is zero. So in that case, just say uh, true. You can create, you have obtained the solution. And here in that case, <laughs> you can actually uh, say uh, print. You can print solution as well. So you find the solution and the current solution is the one that you have. Otherwise, if n equal to zero and k is greater than zero, so you don't have any remaining coin and the value that you need to create is greater than zero, then you will just return false. This is, so false means that this branch essentially does not go anywhere. Or if k is less than zero, so maybe you took some coins essentially, for example, here, if you take a three, six, four, three, then the value, the remaining value becomes minus one. And in that case, you need to uh, essentially return false. So you, ju you just want to make sure that this is something that is called a stack overflow, that you are just doing recursion a lot and goes forever. If the recursion goes forever, <laughs> goes to infinity, that's the, essentially, uh, uh, some of the programs actually, they will mention this is a stack overflow. Some like C++ may not give it to you, and but just take forever. It means that something wrong happens and the length of this recursion essentially goes to infinity. So these are the checks that you will put in. The, the most interesting part is this one. It says that return all of these guys. What is this guy? It says that, uh, so this is the, uh, this is the essentially the brute force things. It says, uh, okay, now I have two options. So I am considering the, uh, so here there are N remaining um, sizes or items that I can, Let's decide about the item number n, the first item, essentially. Good. Among the remaining items. So either you will do essentially the size of the items that you have it, you will put it n minus one. It means that you are uh, you are ignoring this guy. I don't want to pick the current item n. Good. So it, you can think about, I mean, these are the items, like essentially the items. Uh, generally, this is the item. Uh, so in this case, 
This is would be the item one, two, three, and four. And it's equal to four. So first you are deciding about six in that case. So you will say either I will, uh, uh, so this is S1, S2, maybe I should put it S1 here as well. Good. So here, what do we do? We say that, uh, okay. Uh, the item number N, either we don't use it, I don't pick up, I don't, put it in the knapsack. In this case, then I will go to, we have one less element to consider. This is n minus one. Then the value k didn't change because I didn't add anything to that. Still, I have the same remaining. K was, I mean, the original size of the knapsack. So I didn't put anything there. So k didn't decrease. And the solution didn't change also. I didn't add anything to the solution. If that works, so I will put or of this. So it means that essentially when you put or, it means that recursively I will call this one and either returns to or false. Of course, here when you put or some of this compiler, they have this one. If this guy returns true, then it does not compute the other one. So that's a kind of branch and bomb that is doing that. So if this guy is true, then don't go to the other guy. And then uh, you don't need, the, then that actually saves the running time. However, it may happen that this is false, then it goes to the second one. Then this is the interesting one. It said that, okay, I have n minus one, but here I will pick the nth element. So for example, in this case, if n is equal to four, I will pick six one. So if I pick six, then what is the remaining one? Would be k minus sn, k minus six, for example, here, if I n is equal to four and do that. So I need to, because I will keep it this, uh, last guy or n guy, then the remaining value now goes down, would be k minus six, for example. And then the solution also in the solution, of course, in my knapsack, I will put the sn. So in some sense, you can consider this solution is the current uh, way that the knapsack is, like the current state of the knapsack. Now, uh, generally for the backtracking, you need to see what is the initial, how do we call it? Initially, we will call it with n, the number of items, and say these are, I mean, there is no need to be sorted actually here even. You can do it. But generally, I will say sorting can be helpful. Sometimes when you do the backtracking even, it would be better to do the solving because in some sense, <laughs> these algorithms also try to mimic greedy, if you see that. I will come back to this one. So uh, uh, here, I mean, I will call it with n, the, number of items that I have it. K is the, uh, I mean, the value that I want to fill in. And empty set is that, I mean, my knapsack currently or the solution is empty. So I will call it and then I will uh, essentially get the solution. Now, as I mentioned, this backtracking algorithm, you don't need to have this S1, S2, S3, S4, or like S, and they will be sorted. However, this is interesting. Always you try to do that. You should try to do as much as possible branch and bound. So try to, I mean, cut some of these branches. For example, I mentioned that we are putting or here. I mean, by default, uh, I mean, the compilers are doing that. If this one is or is true, then it does not compute the rest. That's some kind of branching. Another interesting thing is that if we sort them, not that if you sort this algorithm, Actually, this algorithm would be greedy. If greedy works, then this algorithm also would be very fast. Why? Because it's doing exactly like greedy. <clears throat> uh, actually, if you to make it greedy, you need to just change these two things as well. Just change the order of these two guys. Uh, First do it, essentially put it in the knapsack, then you decide that you want to ignore it. So if you sort this guy, so if you, you sort these guys and then do this exchange, uh, this change of that, if the greedy actually give the solution, this algorithm also give the solution with the same time almost. Why? Because this is doing exactly like the greedy is doing that. These are the sorted, it try to find this element. If that element works, then it puts it. The next element, if it can put it, then it will put it. So if the greedy, and this comes from the largest guy. So if the greedy gives an answer, this problem gives an answer, it finds a true. When it finds the true, then all other branches will be essentially cut 
because this guy became true, you don't say you want to find one solution. You don't want to find one solution. So all other branches will be cut. The running time of this algorithm would be the same as grid. Good. So that's the beauty of this algorithm, essentially. You will write it that in some sense it has the uh, uh, greedy, but it is better than the greedy because uh, it can guarantee that it finds the solution. If there is a solution, if the greedy solution works, then it finds it very fast, the same as greedy. If not, then it does not make the, I mean, the greedy does not change the options. Uh, it does not change the previous option that is selected. This algorithm goes and changes some of them until it finds a solution. And still, it might be, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, so, and this one actually is interesting also to, to do that. So if, for example, you are selecting six and then you are selecting essentially five here. So uh, here, uh, like if the, and then it is four and three. So the greedy, I mean, if this, the solution that you have, it does not work, it actually tries to first change somehow locally this selection, maybe instead of four, it selects three now because four was too much. Let's try to select three. And so it's from the bottom. In some sense, it's doing some kind of local search for you. If it tries to first create this one, if like if you get six, five, four, it would be too much. Then it tries, maybe four was not a correct thing. I will come back here and I don't choose four anymore. I will choose, I will say, okay, I will pass on four and I will go to three. Still, in this case, it would be larger. So it needs to come back and then change five. It changed five, and then if it changed five, then it selects four and three, then actually it gets the solution. So it's doing it very nicely. But these are somehow you need to do it by design. So you need to think about it. That's the thing that I mentioned. Backtracking algorithms are non-trivial to also write it down. Brute force, in some sense, is just brute you don't think about it. But backtracking or branch and bond, generally we will be mentioning it. We are putting it in nice places that you can cut these trees. And for example, here, as I mentioned, that's the beauty of this algorithm that if the greedy works, this algorithm also works in polynomial time essentially, because it's just doing exactly greedy, just mimics greedy. If not, it tries to do changes the local search and find a solution. And uh, maybe it is that the grid is not working, but with some small changes to the selection, you can do it. This algorithm finds the solution. Uh, as I mentioned, the only thing is that you need to change the order of these guys. For backtracking, if you want to just do brute force, doesn't matter. But if you want to do it smartly, it would be better to first select these guys and then pass on those things. The running time still would be, the worst case would be two to the end. Why? Because each item either will be selected here. So this item will be selected here, the item SN, or not selected here. So it is one way or the other, either selected or not selected. So there are two options. There are n items. So there are two times two <clears throat> times two, which would be two to the n. So the worst case can be two to the n. But if the greedy is working or uh, some small variation of uh, changes in greedy work, that actually finds it very fast. Uh, by the way, I. Uh, uh, mm. I strongly recommend that if you have not implemented this type of algorithm, go and implement them. These are actually very nice things. And there are very nice ideas that exist actually for that. One of them is actually this dynamic programming that we will talk about. Good. So let me clear our drawing. Now let's go to the next approach. So uh, what is this one? So the actual, <laughs> this is exactly, hmm. an easy way to turn a backtracking algorithm into the dynamic programming. So you can, dynamic programming would be exactly like this. The only thing that you will see that this, we have this N and K here, 
So we have this, you see that this problem is just is talking about in an, oh, hmm. yes. So here we have this NK as the main thing here. Solution is something that we can deal with it later. But here, say you want to see whether it is possible or not. To find the solution, we will discuss that one. But uh, to see whether there is such a solution at all or not. So it would be exactly like that. So here, you don't need actually to print solve. So you may actually, it, this one, you don't need to actually report all here. This is just for things. If you want to just get whether it is a possible, there is a possibility or not just answering that, you don't need to have even solve. You can get it up. Then the only remaining parameter would be n and k. Good. And what was n again? n, the remaining, so there are n items that are remaining, and k is the remaining value. Good. The main issue is that you may select something here at the end. So you may select, so n might be large. So here, this is like the whole things. So you may select some items here, maybe select different items, but at the end, you will come with the same n and k here. So you may have some different choices that you may do it at the beginning of the backtracking, but at the end, then you will come back again and again to the same instance of n and k. In that case, let's save n and k in an array. Good. So how can we make this one dynamic programming or more precisely memo is dynamic programming? We can say that if, uh, <coughs> So you will have an array, essentially, I will call it, yes, this is essentially DP array, but you call it just array. If array of N and K, say, so we have, it has three values. If array of N and K is uh, not equal to minus one, return, array of, Good. So I will say that if so, minus one means that I have. So first, you are initializing this uh, uh, matrix, this array, to all minus. You can just do it. For example, uh, NumPy, you can just uh, put everything minus one. Fill in this minus. Then you will say if it is minus one, then you just uh, return. Uh, Okay, so uh, here, what are the values? The values can be zero, one, and minus. Minus one means not filled or not computed yet. So minus one means not computed. A zero and one means that zero means false, means there is no solution for that instance. One means that there is a solution. Good. Now, here I will say that if array of n minus n and k is not equal to minus one, then return the array of n minus k. It means that we have computed already. We pre-computed in some other branch we have computed. Just return this value. Otherwise, do these operations. But before you return, so uh, then you should not return. So just actually put this one instead of return, just change these things. So put array of n k equal to this, and then return array of nk. Good. So whenever you want to return it, before return it, so either you have computed it before, that you will just return it. Don't do anything, because you have already computed. Otherwise, if you have not uh, uh, if you have not computed, then just compute it regularly. But don't re before returning it, save it in the array and k. So you need to do the same thing here. Also, before here, when you return it, you should not just return it. Before returning it, uh, essentially put array of the same thing. Put array of n k is equal to true. Array of n k is equal to false. And just at the end, just return array of n k. Just before returning, save it in an array. Good. 
good? Now, what would be the running time of this algorithm then? Yeah? In time scale. In time scale, because I mean, essentially anything that you will try to do this backtracking, uh, you can show that everything here, if you are just filling the space of this array, and you can say that, uh, like, uh, yeah. So uh, everything that you have it here, the total computations would be just computing this uh, space of this array, which is n times k size. So all of a sudden, this is, as I mentioned, this is the technique that is called memoist dynamic programming. But you can also do it. This is the recursive way. So when you go from recursion backtracking to uh, dynamic programming, this is the memoist version that in some sense we memorize the solution that we have come from. So you can show actually that this algorithm only spend order one per each cell of this array. <clears throat> and the running time of this algorithm becomes NK. You can actually check this one. That would be a good thing. So, I mean, you can uh, just write these programs, uh, like in Python, for example, or C++, and just see the difference between the running time of these two algorithms. One that uh, is not doing memoist and give a big numbers. You see how much this one change doing that. When you make it memoist, you see how faster your algorithm. This is indeed this memo, uh, uh, this uh, uh, somehow memorization of the solutions of or the, the solutions that you have computed before. That's also one way of speeding of the backtracking algorithm. So you may see actually, for example, in Geek for uh, Geeks or this uh, other. Also, this is ACM ICPC programming. That's another one that you are seeing it or information uh, like or informatics uh, uh, international informatics on Olympia that you will. Informatics uh, Olympiad in informatics or computer essentially. So there also, if you go there, you will see lots of this problem. So this one, it might be the case that you, so you try to do a backtracking algorithm. So this is the backtracking algorithm. You may not be able to save everything in the solution, but you can at the end of the things, when you reach to the leap of this tree. So in some sense, this is a search tree that we are doing that. It might be the case that when you reach essentially to the this leaf of these trees, at this point, you have enough space to save some of these solutions. That gives some speed up to the backtracking. For some of the problems, that's the way actually to solve it. So when you go there, when the solution becomes smaller, you will save those things, such that if next time you will come there, you have the solutions there. You don't need to recompute it all over. Because you, if you compute and the same solution, like for example, here, this is the maybe. Back to right. So uh, people at uh, Zoom, do you hear me well? Yes. Okay, and you can see the, my writing. Because it says internet was unstable, I just want to make sure that you are seeing everything fine. Good. So that's the dynamic programming and the memo is dynamic programming. But you can actually write dynamic programming actually without uh, all this uh, backtracking algorithm. So this is a way that, I mean, the backtracking and dynamic work, I mean, work well. If you want to do recursive algorithm, that's a nice algorithm. Recursion generally because of you are using a stack essentially. So that's, it is implemented by some stacks that we talk about it. it there are some overhead for the back to, for the recursion algorithm. You can, if you want to write it, you can actually write it uh, like, uh, more directly like this. You can write it also by uh, writing essentially a for loop. But here, uh, by the way, one other thing that here I didn't mention is that how can we find the solution that I didn't mention there yet? 
Let me also mention that how can we find the solution as well? Look, that, that would be essentially the dynamic programming that we want to do. So this is the DP of NK. Uh, what does it do? So uh, here, it says that if flag, so the flag essentially is the solution, the same as the array that I have mentioned. So this is the array. So if N and K is not equal to minus one, then return flag of NK, and it is all initially equal to minus. No, if n equal to zero and k equal to zero, the flag of nk would be one. It means that, I mean, of course we have a solution. This is the true false thing that I have mentioned. If uh, n is equal to zero and k equal to zero, then flag of nk would be zero. And if uh, k less than zero, then flag of nk would be zero as well. It means that there is no solution here. The only thing here is this one. So here, uh, what do I do here is uh, say, uh, what do I do otherwise? If flag of, so uh, here the DP of NK, what does it do? It goes and, uh, so look at the um, essentially N minus one and K. Uh, Good. And actually here you should say that, uh, yes. So uh, yeah, if you have pre-computed that one, then we are done essentially. Uh, <clears throat> uh, then uh, here, uh, yeah, this should be some changes here. So you should not say DP of, you should not say flag, you should say DP of, okay. So this, let me just change this one. So this is the DP of N minus one K and this is the DP. So you need to actually call it. This is the recursion. So here, what do we say that? So if it is the case, it means that it's not pre-computed. Because if it was pre-computed, then we return the solution. He said that no, if the DP of N minus one and K, it means that if there is a solution for N minus one and K, then what do we do? Then begin. Then this computation should be stored. Flag of NK is equal to one. Also here, we are recording the solution. We say that solution of n and k is equal to zero. What's the meaning of solution of n and k is equal to zero? It means that the nth item is not selected. Not my solution. Good. Now, what about, so if it is the case, then it is the case. Else essentially, so this is the else case, else if, if that, that happens, then we are good. Else if dp of n minus one and k minus sn, so in that case, you are selecting the sn, then if it is the case, I still put this guy one, and then uh, soul of n and k, it would be equal to one. Because in this case, we are actually selecting the nth item. By the way, so we can also mention here, uh, before this one, this is generally, we should also have this one. We can default, flag of nk should be equal to zero. So even it is my, not minus one that we will return it essentially. In this case, we uh, so that's a first line extension. Then we are initiating flag of nk equal to false. Because say the default is false until we find a solution. So the default is false, so we will essentially do that one. If there are some of this, we are changing some of this flag. If not, we are running this DP algorithms and then we change the flag and the solution accordingly. Finally, we just return the flag of NK. Yes. Good. I, I, I need to come back to this. That's an important one. But anyway, I mentioned this one because now we are, uh, so in the rest of the class, we are seeing some several dynamic algorithms, et cetera. I just refer to this the way to, you compute the solution as well. So this is the way that this is the whole dynamic program. It, all of them would be similar in that case. Uh, but the, how we can find the solution, that's the general way that you can solve essentially solutions and I program. So uh, uh, let's say we are just computing this dynamic program. You say DP of NK, it finds it. It didn't give you the solution yet. It just computed some solution array essentially. 
from the solution array, we need to find the solution itself. So somebody say, okay, print me the solution. You say true or false. Give me the solution whether your solution was correct or not. This is some kind of sanity check as well. How do you do that? Uh, then you can actually do this one. You can uh, this. You can also write it uh, recursively. You will say find all n k. So find soul n k is very similar to this dynamic program. The only thing is this one. So when you go there, uh, so uh, but I mean sometimes it's a simpler version of that. It says that uh, if Uh, so if a uh, flag nk is equal to zero, then, then I think uh, print no solution. So if the last one is like zero, it means that it was false. We couldn't. Else, what should I do? If so, then it, it, so it means that it is one. Then here I will say that if soul of n k is equal to one, print uh, include. Sn. Then, what do you do? Then you will, in this case, you will do uh, find soul n minus one and k minus Sn. So you re So if the solution n k is equal to one, it means that you should include this guy. That was by the way that we have obtained it. So you just print that you are include Sn essentially. And then you will find the solution for the rest. Yes. So for the case where like we're using uh n minus one for like when you if D P n minus one k if when you set solution n k to zero. Yeah, yeah, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. So, so this is one part. If the, I include the solution, else, I mean, else in that case, it means that the solution, I mean, does not sol of n k is equal to zero. It means that s n was not included. So in that case, you don't need to print it. Just find n minus one. Okay. That's essentially the algorithm that finds the. So this is like say the, some kind of <laughs> pseudocode between C and Python, more Python, I would say. So it is essentially that's the that's the general way that if we are just somehow we are doing the logging of the. So we will make uh, this whether this was the solution or not this item. We will make a log of that, and then we have this find solution that is a recursive algorithm. Then once you have computed everything, then you will ask there, this guy goes and find the solution for you and print. This is the way that we always doing it essentially. This is the general way that uh, we are essentially bookkeeping the solutions or like the, some, some way for the solution. And then we have another procedure that goes and finds the solution. Good. So that actually I have a uh, good. So we have mentioned it now that you have the general ideas about these three algorithms and the way that you can find the solution. Now I can just give you several other interesting problems and how you can solve them actually. So let me, so this is the way that always we are doing that. Whenever we try to find a solution say that refer to just the case that we have done it for this knapsack problem essentially. This is or subset sum. This problem that we discuss is subset sum or knapsack. Knapsack is a bit more general. This is. <clears throat> Good. 
so uh, let's see another example. So the, another example that we want to talk about it is uh, this longest common substring. So what is the longest common substring? It's actually a very important measure. So whenever you have two strings, you want to see how much these uh, strings are similar to each other. There is a, this concept of edit distance and the longest common subsequence. And these are complement of the other. So generally, if the longest common uh, subsequent, uh, subsequence is k, then and the length of this two string is n, then uh, edit distance would be n minus the length of longest common substring. But they, also the dynamic programming are very similar in both of the cases. But let's say this version. So you are given a sequence essentially. Um, so uh, like uh, first, what is a subsequence? A subsequence of a sequence is a sequence that you are just deleting some of these elements. For example, if you have A, B, C, D, E, F, this is a sequence, a subsequence of that would be A, D, F. Why? Because you can just delete this, this, this. So A, D, F remains. So this is a subsequence of this sequence. Now, your two given strings are given to you, A1 to A, N, and say B1 to B, N. Two strings are given to you. You want to find the largest common subsequence of these two. As you will see that this is some concept of similarities of this uh, item. If, the, if it turns out that the longest common subsequence becomes the length of n, it means that one is the, or n and m are equal, it means that these two are zero, essentially. It's just the distance between them is zero. So that's the way, essentially, this is the measure of computing similarity. measure of computing similar. Good. Now let's uh, do this one. So for this one, you can always now use this kind of recursion algorithms. You will do the recursion and then you will do memoise version. The mo whenever I will say memoise version, exactly the same thing that we have done it. We will keep the Essentially, we do bookkeeping for the array that whether it was true and false, such that we don't need to recompute it. And also, we will uh, essentially uh, keep track of uh, solutions as well. So then I only need to say what is my recursion in that case. So uh, let's, this is defined that uh, LCS of IJ be the length of a uh, line. So LCS means uh, longest common subsequence. This is the procedure. IJ, it means that what is the length of the longest common subsequence of A1 to a, a, AI and B1 to BJ? Good. So uh, the strings that are given to us is A1 to AN and B1 to BJ, BM. So uh, if you want to find the two strings, we should just, uh, if you want to find the LCS of two strings, we should just call it LCS of N and N. So that we will call it in the main thing. Now, here, this is a sub problem. So this is, you say LCS of IJ, it computes the LCS between A1 to AI and B1 to BJ. There here that I is less than, I is less than or equal to N and J is less than or equal to N. I only need to say the recursion. Then the rest is the same, some kind of theory that we have already discussed, the same technique that we have discussed. So what do I say? So you said that LCS of IJ is zero if I is zero or equal to J zero. So if the length of one of these string is zero, of course the length of the largest common subsequence would be zero. And again, I don't repeat it, but you need to also keep these ones in the array as well. Now, there are two options. If AI is equal to BJ, this is actually, a, this is a nice thing. This is a, uh, uh, this is a greedy choice that we will do it. And we can, you can, you should prove that whenever you do the greedy choice, that is the correct thing. So instead of if AI is equal to BJ, I will always, select, uh, so then I will match AI and BJ, and then I will say, I will add one to the LCS, because I know that I have, I could match these guys. So 
AI is equal to BJ. I will, so this is the two this guy. So for example, this is again, AY to AJ, AI, and this is B1 to BJ. So in this case, if they are equal, I will match them. So I will match these guys. You can show that always is better to match these guys. Because if you don't match these two guys, I mean, this guy, maybe AI is matched with some other guys here, essentially. But there is no difference. Instead of matching this guy with here, you could just match with PJ and forget about this matching. So always it is beneficial that if these two guys are equal, match them. That you need to have a proof for that. But you can think about it. It is always better if these two guys are matching, uh, you just match them. So you will match them. Then you will get it plus one because you get one matching. And then you will compute the rest of it for I minus one and BJ minus one. So you will say LCS of I minus one and J minus one. What about if AI is not equal to BJ? So in that case, AI and BJ cannot be matched. It means that either you need to drop BJ from the string below or AI from the string top. And you continue this. Because you know that these two guys are not matched. So it means that if there is a matching, maybe AI is matched here or BJ is matched here. But definitely AI is not matched with BJ because they are not equal. So you are doing exactly this one. You will say max of these two options. You will do max of LCS of I and J minus one and LCS of I minus one and J. You don't have any plus one here that you had because plus one, you get plus one when you have a matching. You didn't have any matching here. So you don't get the plus, but you have this option of take both, in, both of them and then take the max off. Again, this is, if you are just running this one, that would be the brute force algorithm. But just if you do this kind of memoist dynamic programming that, uh, um, um, memo is dynamic programming, you will save whenever you are doing these options, you just keep track of those things. And also in the solution. So for example, if AI and equal to BJ, in this case, it means that you should match actually the solution. You should say that the solution would be equal to AI in this case. So you will just do that exactly the same recursive algorithm that I have mentioned. When you computed the, the solution, the, the whole dynamic programming table, or array, then you will find another solution, another uh, recursive procedure that it can go and find the solution for you. Because in some sense, each of these operations that you have done it, you have, you are keep tracking of those operations. And then you will come back and you will find the solution. So if you are just doing this one, the running time would be two to the minimum of n, M because it consider all options here. But if you are doing a memo is dynamic programming, then the running time would be n times. And that would be uh, uh, good things that we can essentially do for this uh, problem. So uh, good. So there are uh, one or two other examples that I will mention it uh, next time that you are doing that. But this is the, I think this actually, this is like almost the, even the 451 or the next class of introduction to algorithm. With this idea, you can actually go and read all of this. And you should be able to read, go geek for geeks or I don't know, hacker ranks or other things. And then you will understand almost anything and you design your new algorithm. That's the most that you needed actually for any, also if you go for any interview, programming interview, that's the one that you needed. You need to just do exercise on different problem, but that's the most things that you need actually. So I try to keep this one such that you have a very good idea. Backtracking, greedy, and uh, dynamic programming. Generally, I mean, sometimes they may ask for dynamic programming, but lots of them are also greedy algorithms that you need to solve. And, Again, the greedy choices would be great if we can make it, but sometimes are non-trivial that why they are. Uh, good, so let me unshare. Yes, so we are, I think, ending the class and see you for next session. Bye.